In part two of this lecture, as promised, we want to look at a general model of energy changes occurring during the solution process. The reason we want to do this is to give us a better handle on being able to predict when one substance would be soluble in another or not. So this general model will help us explain differences in solubilities of various ionic solids in water, but will also give us a more rigorous way of thinking about all solute solvent combinations, including the molecular substances covered in our previous like dissolves like examples. When a solute is added to a solvent, solution formation is favored if the change in a quantity called free energy delta G is negative for the solution process. Now the term delta G will get a more formal introduction in module 7, but for now you need to know a couple of things. First of all, and this is basically repeating what I just said in the yellow box, for solution formation to be favored for a particular solute and solvent combination, the overall change in free energy for the solution process needs to be negative. In other words, if delta G of solution is negative, then solution formation is favored. If delta G of solution is positive, then the solution formation is not favored. And when we say delta G of solution, we mean delta G, the overall change in free energy for the solution process as a whole, solute plus solvent forming a solution or not. Well, how do we get a handle on this delta G of solution? Delta G of solution is actually or can be determined by a quantity called delta H of solution minus the absolute temperature times a quantity called the delta S of solution. Well, what is delta H of solution? Delta H is what's called a change in enthalpy for the solution process. You may or may not recall that in general chemistry one, you covered what enthalpy changes are, or delta H. T, of course, is the absolute temperature. Delta S of solution is what's known as a change in entropy for the solution process. Entropy is often associated with randomness. We will return to formally introducing delta G and delta S in module 7. But for now, let's see how we can at least qualitatively or even semi-quantitatively, meaning use some numbers, to get a handle on the signs of delta H of solution and delta S of solution, and thus giving us the ability to predict the sign of delta G of solution which would allow us to predict whether or not solution formation is form is uh, favorable or not. So let's first examine the enthalpy term, delta H of solution. Again, recall from first semester general chemistry that the enthalpy change, delta H, for a process or a reaction represents the flow of heat energy into the system that would be when delta H is positive, which would represent an endothermic process, the absorption of heat energy, or out of the system, delta H being negative, an exothermic process, heat energy flowing out of the system. Technically speaking, and this was also covered in General Chemistry 1, we can only call heat flow enthalpy change under conditions of constant pressure. But worrying about that at this point doesn't help us. So for now, just think of delta H as heat flow. Delta H is positive if heat's flowing into the system, 
or in other words, the solution process requires heat to be absorbed from the surroundings, or delta H is negative, an exothermic process, meaning the solution process gives off heat to the surroundings. The enthalpy change or heat flow for solution formation is labeled delta H of solution. It just means we're looking at heat flow while we're trying to get something to dissolve. Heat flow for the solution process, delta H of solution. If heat energy is released during the dissolution of a solute in a solvent, in other words, if you were holding a beaker and trying to get something to dissolve in water and the beaker, beaker uh, felt warm, you'd say that delta H of solution is negative. And that dissolution process is exothermic. Heat's being released during the solution process to the surroundings or into your hand as you hold the beaker. If heat energy is absorbed during the dissolution process, in other words, if you're dissolving something in water and the beaker feels cold, well, it must be absorbing heat from your hand, your hand representing part of the surroundings. So delta H of solution there would be positive and the solution or dissolution process is considered to be endothermic. Just keep in mind that if you count it on a beaker feeling cold or hot to determine the delta H of solution, you might be fooled because Sometimes when the heat flow is very small, one way or the other, you might not feel anything with your hand. So just because it doesn't feel hot or cold doesn't mean that delta H is zero. Now to make matters seemingly a little more complicated, but it actually, I think, will help, we need to realize that delta H of solution can actually be considered to be the sum of three separate enthalpy changes. So we'll say delta H of solution is determined by the sum of delta H for the solvent, meaning the enthalpy change for the solvent, the enthalpy change for the solute, and the enthalpy change for the actual mixing of the solute and solvent. The delta H for the solvent is always going to be positive, and you ask why, why would heat be absorbed? Because what this represents is heat energy required to separate the solvent molecules from each other. And by definition, as I just said, this would be positive. But how positive depends on the strength of the intermolecular forces between the solvent molecules. So to get a solution to form, you're going to have to coax the solvent into solvent molecules to separate from each other in order to interact with the solute. So by definition, delta H of solvent is positive. For similar reasons, the delta H of the solute, which would represent the heat energy required to separate ions in an ionic solid, in other words, for example, with sodium chloride to separate sodium ions from chloride ions, or in a molecular solid, the energy required to separate the molecules from each other and how positive this is depends on the strength of those intermolecular forces operating in the solute. By definition, and this may not be terribly clear at this point why, but I'll just tell you that by definition, the actual mixing process involves the release of heat energy. Now, how much heat energy is released will depend on how favorable the interaction is between the solute and the solvent. Now, we can illustrate this uh, equation here that the overall delta H of solution, which we ultimately want to find out whether is positive or negative, is the sum of these three delta H's. By comparing the energy diagrams for the dissolution of two different ionic compounds, ammonium nitrate and sodium hydroxide in water. If you dissolve solid ammonium nitrate in water, it's an example of an overall endothermic process. In other words, we'll show that the 
dissolution of ammonium nitrate in water gives a positive delta H of solution. You know that experimentally if you hold a beaker of water and try to dissolve ammonium nitrate in it, the beaker is going to feel cold. So the overall delta H of solution is positive. Now in contrast, if you take solid sodium hydroxide and you drop it into water and hold that beaker, that beaker is going to feel warm. In fact, it could get pretty hot. So the overall delta H of solution for the dissolving of sodium hydroxide in water is negative. What we're going to do on the next slide is make some energy diagrams, you'll see what I mean in a second, which will try to explain why the delta H of solution is positive for ammonium nitrate and negative for sodium hydroxide. So on the left here, I've written the equation, solid ammonium nitrate dissolving in water to give ammonium ions and nitrate ions. And this solid line here is our baseline of energy, which would, you could think of as zero. And what I have here is a little box representing the water molecules, the solvent molecules at this energy zero. So the bottom of the box right here, this line represents zero energy. And we said that it takes some heat energy to separate the solvent molecules from each other. So that represents the positive delta H of solvent. You've got to put heat energy in to separate the solvent molecules from each other. These little blue ovals here representing water molecules. Now at the same time, ammonium nitrate, if it's going to dissolve, it's in an ionic crystal form. And this little diagram is the best I could do. The ammonium ions and nitrate ions are not necessarily the same size, and I don't distinguish them by color here. But the point here is that we need to separate these ions. And so this diagram is supposed to represent the ions of uh, ammonium ions and nitrate ions separating. And that also takes an input of heat energy. So that's delta H of the solute. Keep in mind, at this point, this is an artificial uh, mental exercise. Doesn't mean these uh, numbers here, or the lack of numbers, in other words, that delta H of solute is positive and delta H of solvent is positive are bogus. Just hang in there. If I add up these two heat energies required, enthalpy changes, we see we've, we've put in this much energy. If I take this arrow and add it to this arrow, we'd be up around here. Well, now we're going to allow, so that, that, that's how much energy we've had to put in. Now we're going to allow them to mix. So this box represents the mixing of the ions with water. So now they have aqueous after them. And we said the delta H of mixing is negative. Heat energy will be released. Now in this case, we don't get all the energy back. We only get part of it back, meaning we only get part of the energy we put in back in the delta H of mixing. So the overall delta H of solution to go from solvent and solute to solution required plus 26 kilojoules per mole of energy. Now you say, wait a minute, I can see that the overall process starting from here and going to here where we ended up is would give a, a positive delta H where do you get a number here when there's no numbers here? Turns out this actual number here can be experimentally determined. So the beaker feels cold when you dissolve ammonium nitrate in water because despite all these energy inputs, the delta H of mixing only gives us part of that input back. So overall, we've had to expend heat energy or absorb heat energy from the surroundings to get this thing to go into solution. And not surprisingly, this is one of the reactions that's commonly used to uh, get a cold pack to work. Now let's look at the dissolution of sodium hydroxide in water to give aqueous sodium and hydroxide ions. 
why did I draw this at a higher level here? I needed more room for my diagram. So what we're, what we're going to do is start again at a baseline zero energy. We're going to realize that we have water molecules that need separating and I'm going to assume it's still water so my delta H of solvent here is the same input of energy as for the ammonium nitrate example. We have solid sodium hydroxide. Again I had no way in my diagram to make these spheres different colors so sodium ions and hydroxide ions are not differentiated here but at least the colors are different than in this one. Point is we need to separate the ions sodium and hydroxide and what I'm saying here is this requires a little more energy than with the ammonium nitrate. How do I know that? It turns out that you can actually use some calculations to determine that the sodium hydroxide would require a little more energy to separate into ions than the ammonium nitrate. Okay, what's my point? Well, just as before, we have a total energy input. Now let's see how much we get back when we mix. And whoa, we get a lot of energy back in the mixing. And so overall, when we form the solution, we actually get an emission or a, a release of heat energy. So it turns out that this is also an experimentally determined quantity. And we say that the delta H of the solution is minus 45 kilojoules per mole, which means the beaker will feel warm or even hot when you dissolve sodium hydroxide in water. In fact, if you went to the lab and tried to make a solution of sodium hydroxide, if you're not careful, you could burn yourself holding the beaker because the water would get very, very hot. So let's note some things here and summarize. And uh, some of these things I will be repeating from something I've told you before. The energy required to separate the solvent molecules, delta H of the solvent, can be assumed to be the same in each case that we're looking at here, since the solvent is water in both cases. So my arrows are the same height here for delta H of solvent. The crystal lattice energy required to separate the anions and the cations, in other words, the delta H of solute, is calculated to be about 30% larger for sodium hydroxide. Again, uh, you'll have to trust me, I did do that calculation and that's why I show this uh, needing more energy here to separate sodium and hydroxide ions than ammonium and nitrate ions. The negative delta H of mixing term is determined to be uh, incredibly more negative for the sodium hydroxide water dissolution since the overall delta H of solution is an experimentally determined quantity. So I know that this delta H of mixing is incredibly negative because I know that the overall number is negative. So to summarize to this point, the delta H of solution is the sum of three delta H's, delta H of the solvent and of the solute and of mixing, the delta H of the solvent and solute are always positive. Delta H of mixing is negative. And the overall sum of those three give us the delta H of solution. And in this case, we saw that it's overall positive for ammonium nitrate dissolving in water, overall negative for sodium hydroxide dissolving in water. Recall here that we ultimately want to get a handle on the free energy change, the delta G. And the delta H of solution was just one component of that. So we need to spend some time talking about the delta S term. Well, the delta S term for solution formation, not surprisingly, is called delta S of solution. And it represents an overall change in a property called entropy.
As mentioned previously, entropy can be associated with a degree of randomness present. The change in entropy for a system is simply the entropy of the final product state minus the entropy of the initial or reactant state. And I've written that here, delta S equals the entropy of the final state minus the entropy of the initial state. Well, if the entropy of the final state is greater than the entropy of the initial state, then just mathematically, delta S would have to turn out to be positive and randomness has increased. In other words, we get increased disorder because the final state is more disordered than the initial state. The opposite, if the final state entropy is less than the initial state entropy, then the sign of delta S will come out negative. And that represents a process or a reaction where randomness has decreased. In other words, you've got increased order going from the initial state to the final state. Applied to the solution process, we label the change in entropy as delta S of solution. If delta S of solution is positive, I'm going to repeat myself just for clarity, then the randomness associated with the solution that you're making, that would be the final state, the solution that you're trying to make, is greater than the sum of the randomness of the separated solvent and solute molecules. That would be the initial uh, entropy. So that is the solution is more disordered than the solute in the solvent if delta S of solution is positive. On the other hand, if delta S of solution is negative, then the solution that you're trying to make is more ordered than the solute in the solvent. It would not be unreasonable, or as I wrote here, it would be reasonable, to expect that any mixing of two different substances, a solute and a solvent, would result in a positive delta S, increased randomness in the resulting solution. It just makes sense that if you mix two things, it would create some disorder. So you'd think delta S would always be positive. Here's uh, a thought experiment. If you had two nonpolar gases with similar intermolecular forces, and in this case, they would be similar, very weak dispersion forces. And in this case, we have oxygen and argon, oxygen molecules, argon atoms, and we have a barrier between them. This is the unmixed or initial state. And if you remove the barrier, they just seem to naturally mix into a more disordered or mixed final state. And in this case, we'd say the delta S of solution is greater than zero. Entropy has increased going from this more ordered state to this more disordered state. So again, maybe just common sense would tell you that making a solution has a good chance of causing an increase in entropy. In other words, delta S for solution making, you would think, would be positive. Now, you want to put a hold on that thought because in this particular case, the intermolecular forces between the oxygen, uh, oxygen molecules and the argon atoms were extremely weak, as are the intermolecular forces between oxygen molecules and argon atoms, just weak dispersion forces because they're both nonpolar entities. In situations where the solutes and the solvents show significant intermolecular forces when they're mixed, it's not always clear how much disorder will be created, if any, in the process of making a solution. So again, it seems like delta S would naturally be positive. You'd increase disorder when you make a solution. But keep in mind, when strong intermolecular forces are present, 
delta S of solution may not turn out to always be positive. Now, without resorting to calculations, which we're not ready to delve into at this point, let's say, let's say what we could say about delta S of solution for the formation of our two example uh, solutions, the ammonium nitrate in water, which remember has a uh, positive delta H, and the sodium hydroxide in water, which we said from the previous slide has a negative delta H. Let's see if we can get a handle on what the delta S of solutions would be for these. So again, we're going to use this slide to estimate the sign and something about the magnitude of delta S of solution for the formation of aqueous solutions of ammonium nitrate and sodium hydroxide. Now, some experimental data will help frame our discussion here. I took this data from the CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. If you look up the solubility of ammonium nitrate at 25 degrees in water, it turns out that you can dissolve 213 grams, which is 2.66 moles of this, in 100 grams of water. It's incredibly soluble. Sodium hydroxide appears to be less soluble in water on a mass basis, but if you actually count how many moles of this are going in, it's pretty much the same as with ammonium nitrate. So both of these ionic compounds are obviously quite soluble. It follows that if they're quite soluble, it would be safe to assume that the overall delta G solution of solution, uh, the overall free energy change values for the formation of each of these would both be negative. And you say, well, why are we talking about delta G here when we're supposed to be talking about delta S? We'll get to delta S in a minute. What I want to point out here is that if you recall, we want to get a handle overall in the final analysis on what the sign of delta G is, delta G of solution. Here, just from the experimentally observed solubilities, delta G of solution for both of these should be pretty negative. In other words, be very favorable for a solution process because obviously they're both very soluble. So I have two boxes here, and on the left, we'll talk about the ammonium nitrate dissolving in water. And on the right, we'll talk about sodium hydroxide dissolving in water. And I write delta G of solution equals delta H of solution minus T delta S of solution for the ammonium nitrate. And we're just going to assume right off the bat that we know that delta G of solution for the ammonium nitrate is negative because it's very soluble. What we don't know is how negative it is. We know that delta, a, uh, delta H, excuse me, of solution is endothermic. It's plus 26 kilojoules per mole. We're doing this at room temperature, so we know T is 298. So let's get a guess on what the delta S of solution is. Well, delta S of solution here has to be positive, just mathematically. Well, why? Because we know delta G of solution has to be negative. If delta H of solution is positive, that's not helping us get a negative delta G. The only way we could get a negative delta G would be if delta S were positive, because if you take that positive delta S and multiply by minus T, you can hopefully get a negative enough number to overcome this delta H of solution problem here. Not a problem, it's just that it's not helping us get a negative delta G. So we know the delta S of solution has to be positive for the dissolving of ammonium nitrate in water. And in this case, we would say that ammonium nitrate dissolving in water is entropy driven. Why? Because delta H of solution is positive, which is not helping us get a negative delta G. So enthalpy is not helping us. Turns out it must be the delta S term that's helping us get the delta G negative. So we say the dissolution of ammonium nitrate in water is an entropy 
driven process. So the disorder created during the solution process overcomes this problem with needing to absorb heat energy. Well, let's look at the sodium hydroxide dissolving in water. We know the delta G of solution must be negative. We know that delta H of solution is negative. Temperature is 298. So what's delta S here? Well, delta S could actually be either positive or negative. Now, if it is negative, it can't be very negative because if it gets too negative, it'll make this whole minus T delta S term too positive, which would overwhelm this negative delta H and would make delta G positive. But we know delta G has to be negative because this is a very favorable process. So we'll say, we don't know, delta S of solution could be positive or negative here. It's probably positive, but if it was negative, it just can't be very negative. So what are we gonna say about this? Well, we're going to say here that sodium hydroxide dissolving in water must be an enthalpy driven process, meaning it's probably has a negative delta G mostly because of this negative delta H term. So again, overall, remember, we want the delta G to be negative for a favorable solution process. And since the delta G is composed of delta H and delta S, it depends on the balancing of these two factors, delta H and delta S, that determines whether delta G is negative or positive. In this case, just common sense from experimentally determined values, we know delta G is negative for both. And it turns out that it's the delta S term that's probably driving the dissolution in ammonium nitrate. And it's the delta H term that's probably driving the dissolution of sodium hydroxide in water. Now, before we escape this delta G hell, let's use our new awareness of our solution energetics to try and explain the solubility of sodium chloride versus the insolubility of silver chloride that the like dissolves like concept had difficulty explaining. So in this slide, we're going to try to rationalize the solubility of sodium chloride in water and the insolubility of silver chloride. Now, as we did previously for ammonium nitrate and sodium hydroxide, let's look at the data. Sodium chloride, surprise, surprise, is fairly soluble in water, 36 grams or 0.62 moles per 100 grams of water. Silver chloride is pitiful. 0 0.00019 grams in 100 grams of water, or only about 1.3 micromoles. So clearly, sodium chloride is overwhelmingly more soluble than silver chloride. In fact, it would be safe to assume that the delta G of solution for sodium chloride is negative because it's very soluble, and the delta G of solution for silver chloride is positive because it's quite insoluble. What about the delta H of solution terms for each of these? You can look up the delta H of solution for sodium chloride in the Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. It's actually positive, not terribly positive, 3.88 kilojoules per mole. The value for silver chloride can actually be calculated. And there's a calculation for this in a senior level inorganic text, and we get a very endothermic value, a very large delta H of solution, positive delta H of solution of about 73 kilojoules per mole. So let's look at both of these, sodium chloride in water and silver chloride in water, as we did on the previous slide for ammonium nitrate and sodium hydroxide. Remember, when we write silver chloride going into water, no reaction, a tiny bit of silver chloride does dissolve, but so little that we write no reaction. 
Back to sodium chloride, we know that the delta G of solution must be negative because it's very soluble. We know that delta H of solution is positive, which was does not favor a negative delta G, which means here that the delta S of solution term has to be positive. In other words, some disorder must be created during the solution process. The delta S of solution has to be positive in order for the minus T delta S term to overcome this positive 3.88 kilojoules per, mo per mole and make delta G negative. So as with ammonium nitrate, it appears that the dissolution of sodium chloride in water is entropy driven. The process occurs despite the positive delta H of solution. Let's look at silver chloride. Well, we know here that the delta G of solution has to be positive. And we can see that the delta H of solution is very positive, temperature 298. Well, what about the delta S term? Well, it could be positive or negative. If it's positive, it can't be so positive as to make this minus T delta S term so negative as to overcome this plus 73 kilojoules per mole because we know that delta G must be positive. So it could be positive or negative. So the very low solubility of silver chloride is likely primarily due to the large positive delta H of solution. So to summarize one more time, the delta G of solution is ultimately what's going to determine whether something, the solute, is soluble in a solvent and makes successfully makes a solution. If delta G is overall negative, then the solute will be soluble in the solvent and form a solution. If it's positive, overall positive, it will not be or it will have a very low solubility. Whether delta G is negative or whether it's positive depends on the sign of delta H of solution, which represents heat flow, and the uh, sign of delta S, which represents an increasing or decreasing order during the solution process and of course also depends on the temperature.